many of the things that he has written already in the first seven chapters are not only brought up again in at least a thematic way, things are tied together, certain questions that have been left at least not totally answered, find at least a fuller, sometimes a really full answer in this chapter. Tonight, we're only going to take a glance at the first 17 verses. And we don't have the time nor the intent tonight to look at every phrase or every connection in Romans chapter 8. As you look through this chapter, part of the reason I use the word connection is there's a lot of different flow to this chapter. Not, not just that the whole chapter flows, but you have this back and forth flow where you have a statement made and then later, not even always immediately following. Sometimes it's ten verses later. You have this line or this arrow, and if you like to mark in your Bible, you might have chapter 8, if you've done this kind of study before, marked up, where you've got a line pointing back what Paul has already written, and you've got this almost roller coaster twist and turns throughout the chapter. We're not going to have time, and we're not going to look at all those tonight. We're not going to be getting quite that much out of the chapter. Tonight, you might think of it as like an introduction to this chapter and this section of Romans. Of course, we've been making our way through Romans, looking at the word, therefore. And as the cliche joke goes, we've been looking at what is it, therefore. There are three in Romans chapter 8. Let's open up. If you haven't already, take out a copy of God's word and, and print or screen to Romans chapter 8. As we think about this chapter Let's first think tonight about the gospel, the gospel, the good news. And that, for our purpose tonight, is in the first four verses of Romans. Within the, the Word of God, there are several paragraphs, several statements where you have a description, sometimes more even an explanation of the good news about King Jesus. There are a ton in the letter to the Romans. I, I would venture to say more than anywhere else in one document of the scriptures. We've already, you've already seen several, if you've read through at this point, as you're reading the letter, you're going to find a few more. But in some ways, this is the heart, this is the core. If I had to pick one chapter to take to a deserted island, if I had to pick one passage in that chapter to take with me out in the desert, it might be Romans chapter 8. It'd be in the running for sure, verses 1 through 4. All right, we've got a screen. So I've got to undo everything I've said in the first five minutes of the sermon and go back and review. And Okay, we're not going to do that. But as we think tonight about Romans chapter 8, I'll catch our slides up here. As we think about the gospel from Romans 8, 1 through 4, this is where you get what has happened. What God, if you look at verse 3, you've got that phrase, has happened done or what God did, God did, and for our time, we could read it in that past way, what God has done through the gospel, or what really that doing is, the gospel itself, at least a big part of the gospel. Let's read this first verse together. Before I say too much, let's let the text speak for itself. Partly, I, I say that partly tonight because I could have just got up here tonight and read this chapter with some emphasis. Some have done that. I'm not going to do that tonight. You know I'm not going to do that. But there's, there's something about the way that Paul even just writes this that's powerful. It's amazing. Verse 1, we have the shout. There is, there's our word, therefore, now, no. There's this shout. And if you're filling out the handout, I'd put no condemnation and make sure you put the exclamation mark there, please. It's meant to be that way. Shout. Now, if you're reading this in conjunction and ignoring the chapter break, and that is, that is one thing. If I was on that deserted, deserted island, I'd want chapter 8 of Romans, but I'd really want chapter 7. But as you get to the end of chapter 7, and some of us were here last week, you didn't have to be here Go back for just a moment to chapter 7. Look at verse 21 and 25. He says, so I find, there's that finding, and there's one of our therefores in that chapter, to be a law that 
when I do, here's what I find about the law, when I, do, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. What, what a bummer. And then the end of verse 25, he says, So then, therefore, therefore, we said last week, I myself, left to myself, just with me and the law and my sin and death, what a mixture, I serve the law of God. Contextually, the law given at Sinai with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law. I'm enslaved. The word is to be a slave. I'm enslaved to the law of the power of sin. And if you didn't know what chapter 8 was about, we've already given the, the cats out of the bag tonight, but can you imagine for a moment if you could somehow go back and you had never read the letter to the Romans and perhaps you'd never read anything else of Scripture, at least of the New Covenant Scriptures, and you get to the end of chapter 7, and there's some really good things and bright things said earlier in Romans, sure. But you might expect Paul, chapter 8, as we then divide it, verse 1 to be something really of gloom and doom, to be a big, more downer. And the therefore, therefore conclusion, <laughs> we're in a bad fix. That's not the case. Instead of, of weeping, and instead of the wretched cry of chapter 7, verse 24, we get the celebratory shout, no, condemnation. And so it becomes clear to us as you read the letter to the Romans that the therefore is not building in the, in the idea of because of this, no condemnation more in, in break with that because of what follows. There is no condemnation. Look at the reasons. Verses 2 through 4. There are several of these fours, F-O-R, in the text of Romans and it is certainly true of this section of Romans. Someone translated it as, why not? In between 1 and, three, and 2. And then 2 says, because, or the English standard I'm reading from tonight, if I read it, it says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free, there's the positive way of saying it, from the, from, in Christ Jesus, from the law of sin and death. This law that I'm enslaved to, back in verse 25 that we just read together, which I, I don't conclude is necessarily the law of Moses. The other law that he, he's, he's serving in verse 25, there's, there's a break between those in verse 25, a contrast. There's this power of sin that ultimately is the power of death that Satan has. So the condemnation even implied here is sin. Sin condemns us. The law from another way of looking at it condemns us because it says you shall not you shall and when i don't it makes it even clearer we've seen that and we see that in chapter 7 too there's all this condemnation condemnation and the very end result of the condemnation of verse 1 is death there's a reason throughout this chapter you get so many references to life to resurrected life both spiritually and more physically. You've been set free by the law of the spirit of life. Or could we put it as the, the gospel tonight? And verse 3 adds to that. Here's how it happened. It says, For God has done, there it is, what the law weakened by the flesh like in chapter 7, Paul said, the law is spiritual, verse 14, but I, I'm in the flesh, I'm fleshly. As we noted then, we note tonight, the problem was not so much with God's law that was holy, good, and righteous, Romans 7, 12, but with the people of the flesh. But brought, weakened by that, he says, the law couldn't do this. It couldn't give the result of no condemnation. So why? Because you've been set free in Jesus. How? Because God's done something. Something that changes everything.
Look at the rest of verse 3 into verse 4. Here's what he did. What the law could not do, God has done by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In the incarnation is the big word we often use to describe that. Jesus comes as human and He looks like us. He is like us, except He did not ever sin. He comes in the likeness of people who sin or sinful flesh. And for sin. All this packed so tight here, isn't it? Or as a sin offering. So he, he came human, but he's divine. He's God's own son. And he came to deal with sin. He came to be offered for sin. And then, look at the end of verse 3, the last result before you finish the sentence. He says, and he condemned sin in the flesh. So, no condemnation for us. And it is not that God condemned Jesus. Verse 3 doesn't say that. But it does say that through Jesus, He condemned sin itself. What does that mean? I thought sin condemned me. I, I thought the law condemned me and condemned sin. Law, the law says sin is, it brings it to its height. Dim sin itself. It is that God, through Jesus, not only put a sentence on sin itself to remove it, to defeat it, but it is like because of Jesus' death, because of Jesus' covenant, sin has been executed. Sin has been conquered by Jesus. It's done. Therefore, there is now, for those who are united, those who are in Jesus, there's our words. No condemnation. Then here's what happens to us. Last part, verse 4. This is all one sentence, 3 and 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that leads us to our second thought of the evening. Before we look at that thought, just think about this question. What if we took Romans 8, verse 1, in its context, but even just that phrase, that reality, no condemnation, and made that our theme each day? I, I tried that this past week as I was reading and preparing for tonight. I tried that multiple times throughout the day, just thinking. I'm, there's no condemnation. And it, it affects how you interact with your spouse. It affects our ego. I, I don't so easily invest my ego in things of this world, things that are temporary, things that might lead to some major problems of disappointment and discontentment. How much more compassionate do you think we'd be on others who sin against us? What would it be like if we really took that idea to heart? So then let's think together. Look at 5 through 8. We're going to do this pretty briefly. We have to. Let's look at how the gospel, how it affects or the effect it has on our minds. We're going to use mind and heart relatively synonymously tonight. They are often seen as distinctive, intellectual, emotional. They're, they're really connected, just like the heart and mind are connected to behavior. So there's meant to be, appropriately, a lot of overlap in the text and in our thoughts tonight. Here's what it does to our mind. Look at verses 5 and 7. He says, For those who live according to the flesh, we're already talking about living, set their minds... If you take those two words, minds and set, you, you could make our other English word mindset. The gospel is meant to change our mindset, what our mind is dominated by. That's the question on the screen. It says, those who walk this way or live this way set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. This is a dramatic 
Not at Gath. What's your mind set on? Verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Pull out those words. Death on the one hand. Now coming up, hostility against God. I, I cannot submit to God's law that is good. I can't. Not when I'm walking and setting my mind on the flesh. But when I have a mindset change, then reverse those cannots. I cannot submit to God's law. I cannot please God, 7 and 8. See that? But because of no condemnation in the gospel, because of the way the gospel changes my mind, as it enters my heart, as I hear it, and as I embrace it and celebrate it, as I start thinking and dwelling on it. Now, now the righteous requirement of the law, verse 4, now I can submit, not perfectly, don't go too far, and now I can please God. Verse 8. Because I'm not in the flesh any longer. And this is one of those times in chapter 8, you'll find this in a few other places in Romans, where in the flesh, at least in these places, doesn't refer to being in this body, in this life. There's a more spiritual meaning here. Of this realm of activity and thinking that is as described here in the cannots and in the set mind. Mind is a big key. When I change where my mind's thinking and dominated by, it changes how I live. It changes where I live. I'm not in the flesh. I'm in the spirit. Now, we don't have room tonight to get into when is, it, when is this, should this be a capital S? When should it not be? When is it the Holy Spirit? There are sometimes it's clear, like Spirit of God. Can't get much clearer than that. That's for another time, another setting. I, I will caution you to just be aware of the possibilities of that difference. If you want an example of this dominated mind idea, you could go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. When Jesus is telling the disciples about what's going to happen, and then Peter, oh, Peter. Peter's not going to have that. And what is it that Jesus tells Peter? How does he rebuke Peter? He uses the exact same wording here in, in the original and in our, how we translate it as to the problem. The, the, the real difference is instead of saying the things of the Spirit, Jesus says the things of God. Well, the Spirit is divine. The Spirit is God. So that isn't much of a difference after all. So, so here's one example of someone that's thinking in a way that is not spiritual, in a way that is caught up in the activities of the world alone, in a way that is somewhat prideful and is picturing it the way I, I think it should be. And we don't ever do that in life, do we? But that's how we think. You know, I think we're going to do it this way. Why? Because that's how I think it should be. The gospel... In my mind, that mindset is different now. Thinking differently. And then in this next paragraph that is set up by these last couple of verses, he says you're not in the flesh. I mean, he already said those who are in the flesh, verse 8, can't please God. Just so we don't start thinking that's us, he says, however, verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, in the spirit operation, this mode, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So if you don't think this way and live this way, you're not in Christ. You don't belong to Jesus. And then he says this in verse 10. He says, but if Christ is in you, as a disciple of Jesus, you've been immersed into Jesus, Romans 6, 1 through 4 and beyond, Let's read it this way. Since Christ is in you, you're in Christ. Although the body is dead because of sin, we're as good as dead because we sin, and there are these consequences that will carry through us in this life. The spirit, oh, there's that word again, in balance to death, just like in verse 6 and 7, the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
And then he reaches this point. He says in verse 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give, big surprise, life to your mortal bodies. This is a bodily resurrection in mind through his spirit who dwells in you. And then I put down some other passages on the handout on the screen that take you back again to chapter 7 where you have this flesh emphasis. Whether we say there are 16 times that the word flesh is used in chapter 7 alone, and then you get another five times or so in this chapter, in chapter 8. That's this battle, the flesh versus spirit, that goes throughout these two chapters. That's in the flesh, and I'm no longer, if I'm in Jesus, I'm no longer in that. I'm in the spirit. That means my thinking is different now. What dominates my thinking? One way to, another way to answer that question is when I don't have anything else that I have to think about. When I'm not reading a book for school or when I'm not concentrating on designing this or writing this or sending this text message, what is it that my mind naturally drifts to? And I'm not saying tonight that if it, if it, all, if it doesn't always drift to spiritual things and the gospel and Jesus that you've got a problem. More, it's if it rarely, if ever, goes there, then I'd really start thinking that maybe there's something amiss in my mind, that there's not enough gospel affecting, affecting my mind. It changes how you think. And it's more than just how you think. It changes where your mind is set. That's one of these offshoots from the gospel's work in us. And here's the last one. We've already really alluded to it. It's the life lived. You're still in sync back here. Okay. Life lived. There is, in Romans chapter 8, the whole chapter, not just the first 17 verses of tonight, but all 39 verses, there is only one actual, I think I said specific on the handout, maybe on the screen. All right, yeah. Only one specific, I'll, I'll just borrow, I'll steal that word. Only one specific command in the whole chapter. And it is that, to live. By, according to, in, all those mean the same basic thought, the Spirit. And that is implied. Read through all of Romans 8. See if you can find, here's your challenge, homework. See if you can find one direct command. Most of Romans 8 are assurances and confidence builders and promises because of the gospel, both describing the gospel and describing and explaining what happens because of it. But along the way, because of what God has done, certain things happen to us and certain things happen, are supposed to happen in our lives. And so he keeps saying, you better, you better live. Look at verse 12. So then, and it's just like verse 25 of chapter 7, it's the word we other times translate therefore, twice. It's a big therefore, it's a double. So then, we are debtors. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this one, but have you ever been in debt? It is like the American thing, isn't it? At least the past five decades or so. Debt. And part of where this overlaps is that debt, it changes how you think. It changes how you do just about everything that you do in life if you've got this huge pile of debt hanging over your head. Well, Paul says we're debtors. But look at how he explains it. He says we are debtors not to the flesh anymore. He said he was earlier. He was enslaved to the flesh. I'm not a debtor to the flesh, he says, but to live, there it is, according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Nobody likes that. You will live, verse 11. And then verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body... That would be sinful deeds, contextually, right? Then you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So I'm a debtor. You're a debtor tonight if you're in Jesus. You're obligated because of the gospel to respond and not live according to the flesh any longer, not set my mind there and then not live that way, but to kill, to put to death, 
sin in my life. I'm still going to have sin. Isn't that clear here? But now because of the gospel, it's affected my mind. So now I start living where I'm killing sin. Putting it to death. And then this happens. Let's finish the section and then the lesson will be ours. Four. You did not receive the spirit of slavery. But you're led by the spirit like the ancient Israelites in the wilderness. And just like them, you did not receive the spirit of slavery. This attitude of feeling like I'm enslaved to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of of adoption as sons. I know there, there's some here tonight that are in the process of looking to adopt. There are some that may have adopted. There, there's something special. It's the only word I know to use about adoption. Paul says we're the adopted children of God. Verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, and then you get this little sour note, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And then don't miss the last part of verse 15. Through this spirit of adoption, we now cry out, Abba, Father. And that's in there. Two words are meant to be there. You say there's this powerful closeness that can be ours. And, and this, you see, goes back. You can see how it goes back to our mind, feeling. But it can't help but change the life that we live. Because people that aren't afraid, because there's no condemnation, not afraid of God, the gospel doesn't make me afraid. The gospel says you can be an adopted child of God and cry out with this closeness. The Jews would not allow slaves to call the head of the house Abba. That's not me anymore. Now I'm set free. There's no condemnation. Because of that, I'm living by the Spirit. I'm living according to the Spirit's teachings killing sin. And I'm crying out. When I suffer, I'm crying out. And I have a glorious hope. A future with God. So here are our questions to close with. I've got to catch myself up here. Where's your heart tonight? Where's your mind? See where this question comes from? Where's it set? This week, what am I going to focus on? On the flesh, on sin and Satan, and fear and death? Or am I going to set my mind on something higher than that? Am I living by the Spirit? By the principles and the powerful message of Romans 8? Or am I living by something else that Paul calls the flesh? And this one's a little different, isn't it? Is my heart celebrating the good news of the gospel? Because the gospel, as we already noted, it's what has happened because of what God did. And then because of that, now things happen. Now I can be rescued from sin and death. Now I get to live this new life by the Spirit of Christ. Have you seen it? You've, you've seen it in person. I would say if you haven't, you've at least seen it in film. The courtroom. And the judge and or leader, of the, the spokesman for the jury stands up and says, Here's the verdict. And they say those two sweet words. Not what? Guilty. And what happened? 
the person on trial just sits there. Is that what happens? No. Usually they, they jump up out of their seat and they're hugging their family and their lawyers and their friends that are there. Everybody is, it's not gloom time, it's shouting time. That, that pales. That's trivial compared to Romans chapter 8 where the shout, verdict, not guilt, no condemnation. And then if you read the whole chapter, no separation because of that from my God. Let's set our mind on that as we stand together and sing.